Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Please work. All right, yeah, very good. Good morning, I said. Good morning. How you doing? Is everybody doing okay? Hey, look, two more people trusted Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? It's great to have you here. If you're visiting with us, uh, uh, welcome. My name is Mark. I'm the senior pastor. I'm warming up after my time in the pool, and uh, uh, it's great to have you with us. If you have your Bibles, you can open to Ruth chapter 4. I have lots to say and uh, limited time in which to say it. At least that's what they tell me. Uh, so I'm going to just launch. Is everybody cool with that? We've been talking a ton about the book of Ruth over the past uh, couple months, and in it we've seen that there are messes in our lives. Would everybody agree that every once in a while, life kind of goes haywire? Anybody experiencing some haywire right now? Anybody ever experienced it in the past? Who's lying? Some of you aren't raising your hands, so you know you are. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that honesty. Yeah, messes come, and the question we've been asking ourselves is, where is God in the mess? We've been trying, if you haven't heard it yet, to answer that question by telling you that God is there in the mess. You with me? He hasn't gone anywhere. He's not changed his mind about you. He hasn't loved you any less. He is in the midst of your circumstances with you, and he wants to walk you through that mess. He wants to lead you out of it or deeper into it for whatever his purposes might be. But eventually, he wants to be your rescue, your redemption. That's what the Bible is about. It's the story of man getting into a mess, Genesis chapter 3, and God getting us out of it. By his grace, through his son, Jesus Christ, we can be redeemed. Isn't that the great news? That's the good news. That's the gospel. And that's what I'm preaching to you this morning and every morning in some way or another. So uh, we've been discovering that, and we've kind of watched God appearing in the mess that uh, is Ruth's life. If you've been with us, you've heard the story of Ruth. I'm going to try to very quickly summarize it for you. Ruth was minding her own business over there in a place called Moab when this new family moves to town. It's Elimelech and his two sons, Malon, Kilion, and his beautiful wife. Her name means sweetness. It's Naomi. They move into town. They're there because there's no food back where they live in Bethlehem. And so uh, Limelech gets this great idea to move away from God's town, God's surrounding, God's plan for his life, and to try something outside of that plan to provide for his family. It doesn't turn out well. I mean, at least initially, it turned out pretty good. Uh, he's there. His sons both find wives, one of them being Ruth, another one being a lady named Orpah. But uh, eventually, things kind of turn for the worse. So Limelech, who left Bethlehem to live... In fact, dies. His two sons, whose names mean what? Sick and dying. Malon and Kilion, sick and dying. They both uh, turned out to get sick and died, yeah. Uh, they left behind these two wives. They were married to them for 10 years. But now, Ruth, Orpah, and their mother-in-law, Naomi, are husbandless. And because they are husbandless, they are without hope in the culture that they live in. Back then, ladies, 3,000 years ago, in that culture, if you weren't grafted to a man in some fashion or form, whether it was your son or your husband, you were outside of society. Uh, most women would turn to prostitution. Many of them would die unless someone came to take care of them. Well, these ladies were sitting there. They were uh, in, in probably the worst kind of mess. No family, no food. And they decided, uh, we have to do something. Naomi, with just a little bit of faith that she had left, we'll talk about that later, but she had just a little little bit of faith left decides to heed uh, what God is directing in her life. She hears from someone that Bethlehem's barley harvest is back, and so she says, let's go back to Bethlehem. The two girls want to follow her. Naomi does her best Eeyore impression and tells them all the reasons why they shouldn't. Everything around me is bad. I am schlep rock off of Flintstones. There's a rain cloud over me all the time. Anybody ever watch Flintstones? Anybody? Okay. Uh, so don't follow me. I'm cursed by God. And one of the girls, Orpah, indeed heeds Naomi's uh, advice. She stays there in Moab. Understandable. We'll talk more about her later, too. But Ruth, no, nope, she's not listening. She turns to uh, Naomi and there in chapter 1. She says, Naomi, wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you sit, I will sit. Where you die, I will die. And she gives the reason for it as this. I have put my faith in Yahweh. Your God is my God. And because of that, I will follow you as you follow after him. It's a turning point in the story. 
I mean, Ruth, to this uh, stage in the game, had just kind of been a, an add-on, a, another name in the story. But now she becomes our heroine in the story. And she is the one who we will uh, seek to emulate as we live our lives. She and Naomi go home uh, to Bethlehem. Uh, things don't change there. They're still without food, without family. And so Ruth, hearkening back to some of the laws she'd heard them teach uh, from God's word, said, hey, isn't there a rule in there that if I'm a widow and a foreigner, that I can go pick up the grains of the field that are being left behind by harvesters? And indeed, there is that rule. And she said, why don't I go out there and at least try to find us something that I can, you know, ground into some flour and make a biscuit out of? What do you say? Naomi says, fine. And it says there in chapter 2 that Ruth went out to a field, and it just so happens that the field was owned by a, a family member of Naomi's, a guy named Boaz. We talked that week about how nothing just so happens, right? No such thing as luck, good or bad. There's no such thing as coincidence. There is only, for those of us who understand God and his purposes in the world, providence. That is, his working behind the scenes, ordering our steps, providing for us the good things and even sometimes the harder things for our own benefit. He's working the plan. And he sees all. He saw that Ruth, by faith, was stepping out, and he ordered her steps to land there in the, la in the field of Boaz. Well, things uh, went from, you know, decent to awesome. Uh, Ruth was there at the same time that Boaz was there. Boaz says, who's that girl? The field boss gives a good report, and Boaz says, get her over here. Uh, let's have lunch together. And here's the deal, lady. You don't ever have to leave this field again. In fact, I'm going to put my workers to work for you. Here she was, the lowest of society, a foreigner, a widow, uh, just going out to try to find a few grains of barley to make some cake out of. But all of a sudden, she is elevated, ushered into a corner office, given a management position. She's got other people working for her. And uh, things go well. She went to, went to the work that day just hoping to get enough to eat something. She came home with two weeks' worth of food. Good day, wouldn't you say? She even had a doggy bag from lunch. Well, uh, it goes from there, and, and we're watching in that chapter as God starts his story of redemption. Ruth makes, his, makes her stake uh, or statement of claim, a statement of faith, claim of faith, statement, stake, claim. How's it going? She says, I believe in your God, and because she believes in her God, she just starts walking by faith, and God meets her at every step and says, I'm going to provide, I'm going to provide, I'm going to provide. Well, they just get all, uh, you know, crazy with it, and since he's provided so much so far, they said, hey, let's go for it. You need a husband, Ruth. And so Naomi uh, concocts this plan, not a plan that most of us as parents would concoct for our daughters uh, because it entails Ruth kind of coming off or looking like a prostitute. Anybody want their daughter to grow up to be a prostitute? No, we don't want that, right? If you do, see me immediately following the service. We need to pray hard. But that's not what we want. But that's, listen, we talked that week about getting outside the box and how every once in a while we're going to have to do things that we would not initially determine as being sensible or, 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 or you know, within our realm of possibility. We're going to have to step out of sight of stuff and, uh, and, and just trust God to do what he's going to do when, when we're outside the box. We, we need to be a, 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 a willing to be creative in, in the things that he wants us to do. Well, that's what they did, and it worked out great. Ruth said, Boaz, I want you to be my kinsman redeemer. A kinsman redeemer is someone who is a relative who, according to Levitical law, uh, could be the Levirate uh, redeemer, which basically means this, that, that you are, uh, because you are a relative, you are able to redeem the properties of the husband who died and the, and the, and the birth of the sons or, or the name of the, of the dead uh, husband, the deceased, I should say, uh, could live on because you took that man's wife your relative's wife. It's a longer, drawn-out thing. I don't have time to explain it, but that's what he was. And so uh, Ruth says, Boaz, I want you to be my redeemer, and Boaz says, I'm in. And I'm not just in because it's my right, because it's going to benefit me financially to have your lands and my lands you know, mixed together. I'm in because you, Ruth, are a woman of character. In essence, he's saying, I love you, Ruth, and you are you are." so worthy of anything that I have. I can't believe you'd even consider me. Well, story just gets get better and better, doesn't it? I mean, she went from being this destitute widow, foreigner in a, in a foreign land, to now she's engaged to be married to one of the richest, you know, uh, greatest guys in the community. 